few of you who are students of that movie, like you have PhDs in Christmas Vacation, and the words that were edited out of, edited out of that scene uh, to make it church appropriate. Uh, we do have children here and stuff. There is some uh, you know, sacred places here. Uh, but I do want to welcome you again today. My name is Steve Lamont. I serve as the pastor here at Orchard Church. And uh, if you're a guest here tonight, we do welcome you. It's, it's just exciting to gather and see folks from all over the community uh, come, family members. So we're glad you're here. And uh, as, as Michelle said before, if you are looking for a church home and a place to worship, we'd love for you to come here. And uh, we're excited about what God is doing in our midst here. And uh, Jen is going to be in the back after service collecting uh, connect cards if you want to share those with us. It really helps us get to know you. And, uh, you know, I've tried to look around, there's a lot of new faces, which is good, uh, but we do have a gift for you if you're able to do that, and uh, we'd love for you to. Uh, would you pray with me real quick as we take a look and talk about our scriptures tonight? God, we thank you so much for this night, uh, this sacred night, this holy night, as, as Heather sang, uh, that we can come and gather and consider and think about uh, the birth of your son, Jesus Christ, and what it means to us today. And so, God, we pray that as, uh, as we think, as we light candles, as we hear from the scriptures, uh, God, that you would illuminate our hearts, that you would push back the darkness uh, through your Son, Jesus Christ. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be with us here, and that you would work in me and through me, and even in spite of me today, uh, that we might hear from you. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. 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 So there is a real-life Clark Griswold. I mean, that was the TV Clark Griswold on there, and, and he had 30,000 twinkling lights up on his roof. Uh, but the Guinness Book of World Records uh, says that uh, the, the record for lights on a house was set one of the first times they certified it back in 2001. And it was a family, the Richards family of Can Canberra, I think so, right, in Australia. And they, on their house that year, they had 331,030 people light bulbs on their house. Guinness came down, certified it, they became the world record holder, and they held that record for over a decade. Uh, until uh, a good competitive American family came along and decided that they were going to best the record. So in 2012, uh, Tim Gay from LaGrangeville, New York, bested the Richardsons with 346,283 likes. Uh, if you don't do math really that quick, I, mean, I do, which is, I mean, I can do those numbers. I really can. Uh, I rely on a couple of them. That's 15,000 more likes. Uh, so uh, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good deal of life. Well, the Richard family, Richardson family in Australia, they're also competitive. Uh, the Aussies are people, they're, they're proud, and they decided they were not going to be outdone by this American family. And so they upped the ante, decorating their house with 502,165 lights, half a million lights on their house. Mark would be quite proud, wouldn't he? Uh, it was estimated that there was 29 miles of wire going around, up, down, and all around their house uh, that for that Christmas. And, and because you can never have enough lights, our heroes from the great state of New York decided that they wanted the title back again. So in 2014, they uh, decorated their house and their grounds with 601,736 lights. It took them two months to build this set on two acres of land. Uh, I probably think that there was literally the guy switching on the nuclear reactor uh, to power on all of those lights. And, uh, you know, Clark Griswold would be proud, you and I would probably be proud of that, is the light display we're going to see. And, and there is something about Christmas lights. Uh, there's something about going to see Christmas displays and seeing the lights uh, this time of year. Uh, when I was a child, uh, my sister and I, uh, once at Christmas, my parents would pile us into the family car, and we would go driving some random night uh, just to go looking at Christmas lights. Anyone used to do that? The parents struggled them through that. Uh, I lived in rural western Pennsylvania. I'm still not sure what lights we actually looked at. Uh, there was no town nearby. There was no city. There's nothing. So evidently we found some. Uh, and then uh, just this last Friday, we took our kids down to Cape and Logan. Shell Village that's down there. And our kids had a great time. Our youngest son, uh, Caleb, uh, who we adopted this past May, it's his first Christmas, two and a half. He's never seen Christmas before. And it was so exciting because as, as we went down and were driving through the lights, he was just pointing at everything with a big smile on his face, just amazed at all the things and all the twinkling lights that were there. His, his face was just priceless that night. So the question becomes, is like, why do we do something like this? Why do we put up lights at Christmas? Why do we, why do we go and, and drive 30 minutes or an hour or whatever it may be to go and see other people's lights? And I think for part of it is, is that it gets a backdrop of darkness that the light offers us hope. Well, maybe a lot of reasons they're pretty. That's a good reason. Uh, but I think from a philosophical or maybe just even deep in our psyche, like in the midst of the darkness, these lights represent hope for us and push back darkness 
in our lives. The prophet Isaiah, uh, several hundred years before the birth of Christ, wrote, wrote, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light, and on those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. When Isaiah wrote these things, the Babylonians were on their way to conquer Israel. They were on their way to take captives back. And, and really, it was a time of death and destruction. Uh, it was a time of warfare. There was little darkness happening all around from physical devastation and destruction. It was a time spiritually where the people of Israel had walked away from their faith as they questioned where was God in the midst of all of these things. And so the people were living in darkness. And Isaiah prophesied that these people who were walking in darkness would see a great light. That a light would dawn, a light that would offer them hope, uh, that would offer them a way. And the hope that Isaiah speaks of and writes about is the hope that we gather for tonight. It is the birth of a child who would become uh, the ideal leader of the words of Isaiah. But this prophet this says these words that this child would become the wonderful counselor. We call it wonderful counselor. Mighty God, everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Light, hope, salvation, it's all present in the form of the Christ child. Fast forward several hundred years to Bethlehem, to the scene that we all know so well. Uh, the Gospel of Luke says that there were shepherds living out in fields nearby, keeping their watch over their flocks at night. And then an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone all around them. And the shepherds were terrified. Now, as I read this this week, there, there's really two words or two phrases that stuck out to me. The shepherds, all we know about them, other than they're shepherds and they keep sheep and stuff, is that they are doing it at night. They're on the night shift. Some of you work night shift. My dad worked night shift most of my childhood. And uh, they're, they're on the night shift. Some of them are probably taking turns sleeping while the other ones watch the sheep. Night shift was a dangerous time for them because at night there were robbers and thieves and uh, bandits out there, the people who would try and steal the sheep, there would be wild animals out there who would try and get a good lamb chop or something like that, some mutton uh, for, for their meal. And the shepherd's job was to protect the sheep. It's night, it's dangerous, it's cold, and it's lonely. But then an angel appears, and I think the other phrase that really stuck with me is that the glory of God shone all around, that at night God's glory shone. That even in the midst of the darkness for the shepherds, even in this dark time, even in a time when no one else was up and awake, where maybe the shepherds felt alone, that the glory of God shone all around them, announcing the good news with skies ablaze. And their good news was this. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born. He is the Messiah, the Lord. You know, I think we often find ourselves kind of like these shepherds. That we find ourselves in dark places. And in the darkness that we experience, it, it, there's, there's sometimes a, a literal darkness that we experience, but there's, there's figurative darkness as well, spiritual darkness. For some of us, this, this darkness can be when we're surrounded by evil or sin or the brokenness of our world. Uh, I don't think any of us, when we, if we were to watch TV or read the internet or, or, or wherever we consume news at, would say that the world is getting better. Uh, you know, that, that the, the days are getting brighter. In a sense, we look around and we see what's happening uh, on, a, on a macro level around our world, and we see tragedy, we see devastation, we see death, we see suffering. There is darkness across the land. On a micro level, and looking at our own families and looking at our own communities, we see the impact of darkness around us. We see addictions and failing relationships. We see uh, families and individuals in financial crisis. We see uh, friends who have chronic health issues. We see uh, people who are battling depression. And the darkness can feel so lonely and hopeless in our lives. That, but notice both in Isaiah and Luke that those who are in darkness are able to see the light of God. Those who, who walk in darkness are not alone. Those who walk in darkness, even though the darkness pushes in, that they are able to experience the light of Christ. I think this brings us to an important truth for us tonight as we think about Christmas. And we think about the importance of why we gather, why we celebrate, why we put lights up on our house, why we light candles in just a few minutes. That no matter how dark the world may seem, that there is always hope. No matter how, how lost we feel, God always shows us the way and illuminates our path. And that doesn't mean it's easy. It doesn't mean that we, 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 we ask God for help or we invite Jesus into our life and all of a sudden everything gets easy and it's bright and illuminating. But that even in the darkest places, that God still meets us there. 
even in the darkest places, Jesus has already been there. Jesus died on the cross for us. Jesus went to the grave for us. The psalmist writes in the 23rd Psalm, many of us know, uh, that even when I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil. We fear no evil because, because Jesus is already there. God is already there. And in, the, in our darkest places, the light of Christ penetrates through the darkness to offer us hope. As an adult, uh, Jesus spoke words and said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The Gospel of John in the first chapter, in his prologue, in talking about that Jesus, it says that, that light has come and the darkness cannot overcome it. I think when we celebrate Christmas, we light candles and we're drawn to the lights of Christmas, because ultimately the lights push back the darkness we see. So tonight, all around the world, in churches like this, large stadiums and movie theaters, in war zones and prisons and immigrant camps and even in homes, people are gathering to read and hear the scriptures, to sing songs by candlelight. Tonight is a reminder that the light has come. Tonight is a reminder that the light appears to us in unexpected ways as a small child. And we are reminded that a single light in the midst of darkness offers a defiant spark of hope. And when we share the light with one another, when we share the light with those who are in darkness in our families and our communities, the darkness is forced to retreat. Because the darkness cannot stand in the midst of light. And so regardless of how deep the darkness is, regardless of how the darkness threatens to snuff out the light, the darkness has not, it cannot, and will not overcome it. The people in darkness have seen a great light. And those living in darkness, a light and so tonight on Christmas Eve, we gather to celebrate Jesus, the light of the world, coming to push back the darkness in our world and in our lives. Would you pray with me?